This evening, we are in uh, Hebrews chapter 4. I, um, I'm tempted uh, just to kind of jump into our text, but I, I do so much like this particular chapter of uh, the book of Hebrews uh, for, this, for several reasons, uh, not the least of which it, it does give to us very clear reason why the fourth commandment remains in force as far as uh, observing the, the Sabbath day and so forth to keep it holy. But the reason it gives is what is summarized in, in our text with regard to this great high priest that we have who has passed through the heavens, who has entered into his rest, uh, the fact that Jesus completed the work of the new creation and has entered into his rest and rested from his works as God did from his is the reason why uh, there is still a day of rest for us and there is still the possibility of our entering into the eternal rest that's really all explained in uh, Hebrews chapter 4. So let me just read the entire chapter, realizing that unless you're well acquainted with this chapter, you may not necessarily understand everything that's going on here. But uh, the thing we want to look at, of course, is what's going on in verse 15. That's what we're going to be looking at this evening. But after uh, explaining that uh, those that Moses led out of Egypt in the Exodus, that the vast majority of them were not able to enter into the promised land because of their unbelief, because they believed the 10 spies who brought back a bad report and didn't listen to the two that actually trusted God and believed that he could bring them into the land with infinite ease. God condemned them, of course, to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until that whole generation died off and brought only those two that brought the good report into the land. I believe they were the only men of war that survived. And of course, the children by the end of the 40 years had grown up and so forth. But he uses this as a warning not to do as they did, not to um, lack the faith that is necessary to trust in the Lord to enter into his rest. The, uh, the land of Israel they were entering into was a picture of the heavenly rest. But of course, the author to the Hebrews now applies that to the true rest of God, heaven itself. So let's just pick that up in, in chapter uh, 4, verse 1. He says, Therefore, let us fear, lest while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you should seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard for we who have believed to enter that rest, just as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has thus said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them, failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day, today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. There remains, therefore, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us, therefore, be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall through following the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, 
that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. Now let me just mention, I read the, the entire chapter again, not because I think it's an easy chapter to understand, but because of the point that um, the author to the Hebrews is making, and that is that uh, there is a possibility of our entering into heaven, into the rest of God, because of the work that Jesus Christ did, because he says in verse 9, or, or verse 10, actually, well, okay, verse 10, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. The rest being referred to here is the rest that Jesus Christ entered into when he finished his work. And that's the reason why a day of rest continues for us today, why the fourth commandment, at least one of the reasons why it's still in force, is because it's a picture to us of entering that rest. And um, again, it's not the only reason. The other reason is that we do need to worship the Lord. We do need a day off. It does need to be common for all of us to worship him. But again, let's not forget the reason why it remains, and that's because Jesus has entered his rest. We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. And because we do, he says, let us hold fast our confession and not like, be like these others who, through unbelief, perished. And then again, the other reason he gives, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. So this one who has entered into the heavens is one who can sympathize with us. And that's what we want to focus on this evening. That's the additional reason or the next reason we're looking at why we should put to death our sins and why we should obey the Lord because what we do affects the Savior. Now again, we are to put off our sins and we are to put on obedience. We are to put off the flesh. Those things which I hope we all hate as well as the Lord and put on those things that we love, the works of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we've seen several reasons why we should do that. This evening, I want us to zero in again on that one particular reason, which is love. And love can be looked at from a variety of angles. The first one, of course, is the fact that um, we uh, love the Lord. We, well... We should love him because the Lord's put his spirit within our hearts. And if we love him, we'll want to do what he commands. And that should be a powerful motivation for us to want to do what is most important to our spirituality, which is killing those sins and putting on obedience. But from another perspective, it's because of the Lord's love for us. Now, we've already seen several things about that. Um, the fact that Jesus came into the world as a man, the fact that he... Uh, did everything that was necessary to save us, the fact that he obeyed, the fact that he died, the fact that he continues to live for us. There is so much that Jesus Christ has done for us. And not to do what he calls us to do is, well, in light of all that kindness and mercy and grace, is, you know, tremendous sin. So that, that should move us, the fact that we love him and the fact that he loves us. But I think there's one more thing that we should consider that has to do with love. And again, as I mentioned before, follows up on the point that Greg was preaching last Lord's Day morning as he was focusing on Christ's sufferings, Christ's grief, what it is that Jesus had to endure in this world for our salvation. Again, the table is a tremendous reminder of what he endured. His body was broken. His blood was shed for our salvation. Now, this is certainly part of what the Lord has done for us out of his love for us and another reason why we ought to put our sins to death. But what I want us to consider this evening is how this applies to him now as he is in heaven and glorified. Does what we do here on earth affect what he experiences there in heaven? Can we, as the children of God, as members of his body, can we either increase or decrease the joy that our Lord experiences? Now, if what we do does in fact affect the Lord, 
doesn't that become another motive, perhaps the most important one we've seen thus far, to put off our sins and to put on obedience? Well, tonight I want us to consider that this really is the case, that what we do does affect him. Now, here's an interesting, actually, it's an interesting question in the history of Christian doctrine in the understanding of what God has actually revealed concerning himself because there is a sense in which our Lord Jesus Christ cannot be happier than he is and nothing can affect that happiness but there's another sense in which the Lord can either be happier or sadder perhaps even grieved and it really has to do with the fact that he has two natures as God Jesus his happiness can neither increase nor decrease. It's always going to be infinite and perfect. But it's true at the same time that as man, his happiness can either increase or decrease. And that's what we want to look at this evening. First of all, let's consider that as God, Jesus' happiness can neither be increased nor can it be diminished. Now let's ask this question. How blessed, how happy is God? How much joy does, does the Lord experience? Well, I think like everything else about him, it must be infinite. Whatever God possesses is infinite. God has power. How much power does he have? Well, he has infinite power. Uh, God has presence, and how much presence does he have? Well, he has infinite presence. He has infinite knowledge. He has infinite wisdom. Everything about God is infinite. And what is true of his attributes of what he possesses is also true of what he experiences. If God is angry, how angry is he? Infinitely angry. If God loves that love has no limits. And so if he is blessed, if he experiences, in fact, joy and happiness, that happiness, that joy must also be infinite. Now, if this is true, then what it means is with regard to his happiness, with regard to his blessedness, he is what, is what theologians have called a full bucket. His bucket is full. His capacity, which is infinite, to be blessed is, is you know, absolutely complete. And there is nothing that you and I can do that will either increase his joy or lessen it. He is always the same. One of the arguments that's used to prove this is, again, thinking about the fact that whatever God has, he actually has in, in a limitless quantity. Now think about what God would experience if he was unhappy. If God was unhappy, how unhappy would he be? Well, like everything else he experiences, he would be infinitely unhappy, which means he would be infinitely miserable. And yet we know that that is contrary to fact. God is, in fact, infinitely happy. So how is it that God can be infinitely happy when things are going on in this world that cannot be pleasing to him in and of themselves, because this is the argument that would be brought against the idea that God can't be unhappy at all. I mean, how can he be infinitely happy and experience no unhappiness if there are, in fact, things going on in the world which in and of themselves are displeasing to him? I mean, how can he be infinitely blessed when his children, when you and I are struggling with sin? How can he be infinitely blessed when his children are persecuted and put to death? How can he be happy when thousands of people who are made in his image every day are descending into hell? Especially when he says in his word that he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Well, that's a real problem that has to be overcome. But in some sense, God must not be unhappy with those things that are happening, otherwise he would be infinitely unhappy. And I think to understand that, it really has to do with perspective. That is how the Lord views these things, what he has in view when he looks at these things. Now, this is a very important point. This will actually, I hope, help you to see how these two things can be true, how God can be infinitely happy and yet how things can be happening in the world which in and of themselves might 
not make him happy. Now, if he was to consider any one of these events that, don't, that he says are not pleasing to him, isolated from everything else, it could not be pleasing to him. But if he considers them in light of everything he was, has actually planned, it can be. Let me give you an example. I've just told you, and I'm, I hope you're familiar with that passage in Ezekiel, where the Lord says, he takes no delight in the death of the wicked. And yet, there are wicked who die every day. So why isn't God miserable? Well, it's because that even though God may not delight in that event, if you were just to consider it by itself, that he doesn't delight in the fact that one of his creatures died in rebellion against him, one who actually bears his own image, who will now have to face eternal damnation. He doesn't delight in that if that's all he was looking at. He does delight in the good things that actually do come from that event. And there are good things that do. The fact that the wicked man who perishes in his sins actually deserves to perish in his sins and that he is being punished justly for his sins. The fact that God's justice is vindicated by this punishment. If, if a man were to commit a crime against God and that crime was not to be punished, then God would be unjust. But the fact that he is being punished vindicates God's justice. And the fact that this person who has committed these crimes has actually injured other people because you can't sin in a vacuum. Whatever you do that's wrong will either injure God or will injure your neighbor. And actually, if you injure your neighbor, you're injuring God, so it will always injure God's justice. It will always offend him, but it will always hurt someone else. Well, when, when these crimes that have been committed are being punished, God's justice is satisfied, it's being vindicated, and those who have been wronged are actually receiving justice. By the way, that is the reason why you and I can forgive those who actually commit crimes against us, who will never come up to us and will never actually um, uh, ask forgiveness. How we can p wait patiently, even though that happens, because we know that even though they're not going to be punished perhaps in this life for it, perhaps there's nothing we can do about it, one day God is going to exact exactly what they deserve from them, unless they repent and turn to Jesus Christ, in which case, Jesus will pay for everything that they've done. Either way, justice will be satisfied. So you don't have to be concerned that any injustice has happened to you in this life. Whatever it is, it's all going to be righted. And that is another good thing that God brings out of even the destruction of the wicked. Now, God didn't create evil. God didn't make these wicked men wicked. God did not commit or cause them to commit these evil acts, but God can use their evil to bring about good. And in the end, he can punish them for their evil. So in other words, he can rejoice in the good things that he brings through their evil, and he can rejoice in the punishment that he inflicts upon them for their evil. He can be infinitely happy in what happens because everything that actually happens, even in their case, is taking place according to his plan for some good purpose. And if that is the case, then how could the fact that these things happen make God unhappy? He's actually brought all this good out of it and he's justly punishing the wicked. Everything is happening in a way that would make him happy. So as I've said, God is infinitely happy, even though things are happening in this world which by themselves would appear not to make him happy because of how he is using them. He is happy with the results. And because he is happy and nothing can actually, um, as it were, rankle him, and nothing can uh, diminish his happiness, there's really nothing that can also increase it. And that's interesting because whatever we do, whether we obey or don't obey, is all a part of his plan as well. 
and will neither increase nor lessen his happiness. If we do what's right, God will rejoice in the right we do. If you do what is wrong, then God is still going to rejoice in the good that he brings out of that wrong. I'm talking about you as Christians now, both in your life and for the good of his kingdom because there is nothing that you can do that God will not bring about for good. God is infinitely happy and God always will be. By the way, that doesn't mean that you have an excuse now for your sin. God's going to work good out of it anyway, so I might as well just give myself to it. You know, now that's not what's being said here, but it does mean that when you do sin, it doesn't take away from God's joy, even though it may cost you something. It may work for your good in the end, but certainly there will be that discipline, and that discipline is not an easy thing to have to, to deal with, but it is good. God will work it together for your good, but it will still hurts, and that's something that you want to avoid. But the point I want to make is simply this. It doesn't take away from God's joy, either from the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit. They remain infinitely blessed. So Jesus, as God, cannot be any happier than he is. You see, he is always going to be completely full. He is the full bucket, but... Jesus is not just God. Jesus is also man. And as a man, his happiness can be increased or it can be diminished. So what we do actually affects him. Now here's something new that the incarnation brings when Jesus became a man because Jesus could not really be blessed any more than he is as God by what we do but as a man, he can be. In other words, as a man, his bucket is not full. His bucket can be higher, and his bucket can be lower. What we do affects them. By the way, this, this is not something that I came up with, but I will mention that name that sometimes I get some chuckles from when I mention it, Jonathan Edwards. This was his answer to the full bucket problem. Before, you could not add to God's joy, but now you can because there is one person of the Godhead who was made like us, who took to himself not just a human body, but also a human soul that has a heart, that has affections. Not that God doesn't have a heart, of course, that he doesn't have affections, but as a human being, uh, his changes and God's does not change. So there is this new factor that has been introduced into this. Jesus Christ came into the world. We've just read in Hebrews chapter 2 and in chapter 4. And he has experienced everything that we have. And now he knows what we feel. Now he knows what we go through because he went through it himself. The only exception, of course, is sin, which he never experienced. But he did experience temptation. And he knows what it's like to experience that to its greatest limit. We often don't because we give into it before it reaches its climax or its peak. But our Lord Jesus never gave into it, so he experienced the full brunt of every temptation. And he did these things, we read in Scripture, that he might become our faithful and merciful high priest. Now, what is the point of everything that I've just said? Well, the point is this. Does Jesus Christ now return to heaven only equipped with knowledge of what it's like to go through uh, what we're going through? Is that all he gained from this? Or was there something more? Well, our, the author to the Hebrews tells us in our text that Jesus is able to do something now that he wouldn't have been able to do as God, and that is he can sympathize with us. That's the reason uh, the author to the Hebrews uses, uh, by the way, for the reason why God did not give us an angel to be our mediator, to stand between us, to be our great high priest, because the angels, at least the holy angels, have not experienced what we go through. And why the Lord has always appointed a man as the priest, it's because he knows what other men experience. And because of that, he is able to deal gently with, with us because he is one with us. That's exactly why Jesus became a man, so that he could, at least one of the reasons, sympathize 
with what we're going through. Now again, to sympathize means that you can understand particularly the pain that another is going through. Literally, the word means to suffer with. And Jesus is able to enter into our sufferings with us. I mean, that's what you do when you sympathize with someone else. You've gone through what they're going through. You know what they're experiencing, and you, you feel it somewhat in your own heart. And it helps you to help them. Well, Jesus can now do the same. Knowing what you're going through, because he went through it himself. He knows what it is to be tempted. He knows what it is to be sick, to be hungry, and to be weak. He knows what pain is. He's well acquainted with grief and sorrow and affliction. He can go through these things with you, and he does go through these things with you. Now, this is interesting because not really much has been said about it, in, at least as far as, as I've seen in the history of uh, interpretation. And I know Greg and I were talking about this. I don't think either of us have ever seen a treatment of it. So I thought I would look up in some of the older commentaries to see if there are any comments. And Henry did write a note on this. He says this, Though he is so great and so far above us, yet he is very kind and tenderly concerned for us. He is touched with the feeling of our infirmities in such a manner as none else can be. For he was himself tried with all the afflictions and troubles that are incident to our nature in its fallen state. And this not only that he might be able to satisfy for us, but to sympathize with us. The Lord understands our pain. And sympathy means not just that he understands it rationally, but that his heart is touched with it. He, in some sense, is moved by it. In some sense, he is suffering with us or grieved over our situation. In other words, he cares. Okay. Now, the same thing, I believe, is true with regard to joy. When we experience joy, the Lord also experiences that with us. Okay, now those are the principles, and here is the application. I want you to realize, first of all, that the author to the Hebrews applies this in a way that's a bit different than the direction that we're going. He does apply it by saying that this should give you confidence when you need grace, when you need mercy, to come to the throne of grace to receive it, knowing that you will receive it because you have a high priest who knows what you're going through and can sympathize with you. But I want to I want to bring that out, first of all, but I do want to apply it slightly differently this evening in line with the series that we've been considering. Think about this for a minute. If Jesus experiences something of what you're going through when you go through it, then there is a very real sense in which what you do, what you're going through, whether it be obedience or sin, is somehow going to either increase or reduce his happiness. When the Lord sees you lovingly obey him, it brings joy to his soul. But when he sees you disobey him, it not only robs him of the joy that he might otherwise have in your obedience, but in some way it causes him a measure of grief and of suffering. Now let me ask you a question that I hope you will find to be an offensive question. And I'll tell you that uh, up front just so you won't be too shocked by the question. Why should you care what you put Jesus through as long as you get what you want? Now, I hope that was offensive. It should be. Because if you love Jesus at all, you will never be happy as long as you know that what you're doing is not making him happy. You can't be happy if what you're doing is causing him grief. It does matter what you put him through in, in order to get what it is you think that you want. Now, that's what love does. Love considers others. It makes you think about how your actions are going to affect other people. And if you love the Lord, then you'll be concerned about 
whether your actions and your choices will bring him joy or bring him grief. And yet, knowing that, how many times have you chosen sin? The sin that brings him grief rather than the obedience that brings him joy. Even though you may have some understanding, I think we all have some understanding at some level that this was the case. That Jesus is going to see, I mean he does see, he knows and he's affected by these things. Just how much do we really love the Lord if we're willing to do that to him? Well, not nearly as much as we should love him. Now, I want to just examine that a little bit more deeply. Does Jesus really experience this for every one of his children? Well, I think the answer is yes. Now, why would that be? Well, first of all, we have in our text the fact that Jesus sympathizes with us, and that's really all we need to know. But there are other reasons that we believe this to be true. I mean, if I were to ask you, does Jesus know what you're going through? Does Jesus love you? Does he care about you? How much does Jesus love you? I mean, what, what are the images used in Scripture to reflect the depth of that? Except that he is our husband and we are his bride and he loves us as he loves his own flesh. Isn't that a statement on how he feels for us when his bride is doing something that she shouldn't be doing, causing him grief or doing something that would, he would rejoice in? But there's another reason, too, and it has to do with another illustration the Lord uses in the Word to reflect our relationship to Him. We are in union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Oftentimes we think about how that affects us, you know, our sin taken away, His righteousness given to us, all these privileges of adoption and so forth. Kingdom of heaven is all ours, but does it work the other way? Is there anything that we do that affects him? Everything he's done has affected us. Is there anything we do that affects him? Well, the answer is yes. I mean, we are his body, and he is our head. And I think that speaks something not only of the authority the head has to command the members of the body, but also the effects that the head will experience if something happens to the body. When something happens to your body, does your head become aware of it? <laughs> Does your head either happier or less happy, depending upon what happens to your body? I mean, if you're, if you're doing something that is pleasant, if you're you know, laying you know, somewhere on, a, on a, a cot somewhere or you know, some kind of a lounge chair uh, around a pool and you're just resting, it makes your head feel good. But if you stick your hand in the fire, it makes your head feel bad, doesn't it? So what happens to your body affects your head. Well, the same thing happens with regard to Jesus who is our head because again of our union with him. What happens to his body affects him. He is aware of what's going on and to some extent experiences what is going on in his body, which is of course us. Now certainly there's no literal nervous system that connects us to Jesus Christ. It's not like this you know, giant spinal cord and we're all at the ends of the nerves and so forth. But there is a spiritual connection, and that is, of course, by the Holy Spirit. That is what affects our union with him. And again, it causes this kind of care and concern and, and the suffering with us. Let me give you the comments of another, I hope, well-known expositor, John Gill. He writes that Jesus is touched with the feelings of our affirmities, such as bodily diseases and wants, persecutions from men, and the temptations of Satan, under all which Christ sympathizes with his people and which sympathy of his arises from his knowledge and experience of these things and the share he has had of them and from that union there is between him and his people. In other words, there are several reasons why he can sympathize, certainly his knowledge and experience, the share that he has had in those things with us when he was here, but also because of our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. He is experiencing them even now. And he goes on to say it's not a bare sympathy, but is attended with his assistance, support, and deliverance, and the consideration of it is of great comfort to the saints. So. When something happens to us, Jesus isn't just 
unaware of it in heaven, going about his business, and then suddenly, oh yeah, I remember so, and so he's going through some difficulties right now. When you're going through it, he is going through it with you. He's experiencing it at the same time. Now that says a great deal about our Lord Jesus Christ, but think about this other thing, because some people might say, well, how could that happen? I mean, how could a man be, how could he know what's going on uh, in the lives of so many people at the same time? Well, granted that there is this connection between the head and the members of the body, how can the Lord do this? Well, certainly no mere man could do such a thing. But we do need to realize that since Jesus has ascended into heaven and has been glorified, certain things have changed regarding him. Certainly his abilities appear to be expanded. I mean, he is equipped to do certain things that I don't think he could have done during his humiliation on earth. For example, he now rules over all the nations and he overrules absolutely everything that is going on in this world for your good and for the good of his kingdom. That's a lot of things, and yet he is able to manage them all perfectly. He knows everything that is going on in this world. He has the power to raise nations up. He has the power to destroy them. Uh, let's just say that he appears to be able to do more now than he did while he was on the earth, now that he is glorified, and I believe it's because of the union of his divine and human natures that gives him the ability to do this. No mere man could do this but the one who is God and man apparently can. Now again, in the same way, he is able to be connected to every member of his body. He is connected to you, and he's connected to me, and to every other person who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he is able to experience joy at your triumphs and sorrow at your failures. Now again, thinking about this may cause us to think, well, I thought Jesus was in heaven and was perfectly happy now. Well, as God, as I've said, he is and he always will be. But as a man, yes, there is joy, there is happiness, but there is also this concern, there is this care, there is this entering into the sufferings of his people as he has been you know, touched with our weaknesses, as he sympathizes with us. Now, is that the way it's going to be for the rest of eternity? For our Lord Jesus Christ, is there always going to be this you know, rising and falling of, of his happiness and so forth because of us? Well, no, actually, it's not going to go on forever because your sufferings and your trials and your failures as well as your successes are not really going to go on forever. I mean, after the consummation, there's not going to be any more sin, no more struggle, no more pain for us. And so there's no longer going to be any pain for our Lord Jesus Christ to sympathize with. There won't be anything left but joy. And here's another interesting thought along these lines. If, if our sufferings can affect him while we're in this state, as well as our, you know, let's say our successes, our triumphs and so forth, uh, will they affect him when we're all in heaven and we're all filled with joy and happiness? Will his happiness increase because... Our happiness will increase. And if our happiness increases for the rest of eternity, which um, certainly Jonathan Edwards believed that was the case, as we learn more and more about this infinite God that we will never be able to learn everything, but as we learn more and enter into a more intimate relationship with him, our joy will increase. As our joy increases throughout eternity, will the Lord's joy increase as well? Uh, I believe that that is the case. So as we grow in happiness, our mediator's joy was also going to grow with it. So as God, his joy and happiness could never be increased. But as man, it can be. And that's, again, a way that, that we can affect him, either for good or not so good. Now, knowing then that his heart moves for us in the way that it actually does and that our decisions will either make him more or less happy, then how can you not, if you love the Savior, be motivated by this to do all that is in your power 
to increase his joy by putting his happiness in front of your happiness. By the way, that's, that's, you know, that's not really the best way to express that because really if you're a Christian, you will find your happiness to be the greatest when you put his happiness first. There's no way to get around that. But you, I think you understand what I mean by this. Is if, you know, if our happiness entails not making him happy, if that's what we think we need to make us happy, if we know that's going to grieve him. And if we love him, how can we put that in front of his happiness? We have to put his first. Because that is what genuine love does. It puts the other person first. So since it is uh, happy or obedience that really makes the Lord happy, if we love him, since that's what makes him happy, and sin grieves him, then do all in your power to make him happy. What makes him happy is this. Put your sins to death and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Obey him. Again, we're looking for motives why we should do that. Well, here's a wonderful motive. If you do it, you will make him happier. If you don't do it, you will not only reduce his happiness, what he might otherwise have had by your obedience, but you're also going to grieve him in some way and take away in, a, in another way from his joy. Now, not only will the Lord be happier if you obey him, but as I mentioned before, you will be happier as well. God does not call you to do these things to spoil your life. He calls you to do these things so that you will be happy. You will not be any happier than you will be than in the path of obedience. And again, that's what he wants you to do for his happiness and for your own. Well, may the Lord uh, use this motive to motivate us. If you don't remember anything else that we've looked at in this series, remember this. I think this is probably the most powerful motive we've seen so far. What we do affects Jesus. If you love him at all, you're going to want to make sure you don't do those things that will grieve him, but those things that make him happy. May God grant that we would be able to do that. Well, let's uh, bow for a moment in silent uh, prayer, and let's ask the Lord to apply this to our lives, to give us the grace to take it to heart, to remember in the next few minutes what we, ha what we heard, and actually to try and apply it uh, during the week. Let's spend a few moments in prayer.